welcome back everybody. Uh, we are now going to continue our lecture uh, in the non-motorized transport series. Uh, we have looked at uh, how to measure uh, bicycle level of service as well as pedestrian level of service. Uh, now, uh, we will get into the design aspects of NMT facilities. So, from this lecture onwards, we will look at the different design principles and how to design uh, different NMT uh, facilities. Uh, in today's lecture, uh, we will be taking you through the 10 guiding principles as well as 6 supportive principles uh, for designing non-motorized transport facilities. Uh, this entire lecture is taken from uh, the NMT guidance document that was developed by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India. So, at the outset, we will be looking at the 10 different principles that are listed in this document. So, this is a, a very well compiled document that takes into consideration the Indian uh, environment, the Indian NMT environment and develops uh, principles or design principles for different types of NMT infrastructure. Now, they are divided into 10 basic principles or 10 uh, guiding principles and we will look at them one by one. The first one is interconnected NMT network, next comes complete streets then bicycle friendliness, walkability, comfort, universal accessibility, safety, security, NMT wayfinding and finally, protection from encroachment. So, when you are designing any NMT facility or any NMT infrastructure, you have to keep in mind these 10 guiding principles. If you keep in mind them, all of these 10, then you are essentially designing a good NMT facility. Now, getting into the first one, which is the interconnected NMT network. If you often ask a pedestrian or a bicyclist, why we do not often walk or bicycle, one of the reasons they will let tell you know or let you know is that uh, there is interrupted facilities everywhere. There, it is not, there is not a continuous for example, and not a continuous sidewalk available from here to where I am trying to go or the um, roads that are connected from uh, my origin to my destination are not suitable for bicycling. So, what they are uh, meaning to say is that if you provide me a continuous interconnected network, then I would be more likely to walk or bicycle or use some other forms of non-motorized transport. So, this is this is logical because when we are otherwise traveling using vehicular modes, we always have a continuous uh, good pavement, right? We always have a good pavement, but whenever there are lots of potholes in the pavement or uh, you have some kind of a kacha road coming in between and the road is not paved, then you feel uncomfortable, right? Even while driving, you feel uncomfortable. You feel that, well, I should not take this route again. I should take some other route. So, same is the case for NMT infrastructure as well. So, when you are trying to walk from your home to the nearest uh, bank and you see that uh, there is a footpath near your house, but as soon as you reach closer to the bank, the footpath disappears, right? So, that, that is discontinuous infrastructure, that is not interconnected network. So, if you have such kind of discontinuous uh, networks, then people will not walk or bicycle or use any other forms of non-motorized transport. So, what is usually the what the uh, guidance document tells us that when you are designing for vehicular traffic that should be more at the periphery of your block whereas, inside the blocks you should have well connected NMT infrastructure, right. So, preference should be given to NMT infrastructure within a block area whereas, in the periphery you can have preference to the vehicular traffic. If you design your streets in this fashion, this will encourage a lot of NMT movements, okay. Especially, we should avoid detours for NMT infrastructure, right. Uh, since you have to walk or bicycle that takes a lot of physical uh, activity or physical energy out of uh, people uh, trying to use them, we should always try to provide them a direct correction rather than a detour, right. It, if for a vehicle, you can easily provide a detour 
which only will take uh, uh, will consume a little bit extra fuel. But in case of an NMT infrastructure, if you provide if the person has to go from point A to point B and you do not provide this infrastructure and rather you provide one that takes a detour like this, he or she may not end up taking an empty infrastructure uh, or may not take uh, a non-motorized form of transport and then would rather just take a uh, two-wheeler or a motorized two-wheeler and reach here. So, it is always good to avoid any detours and provide direct correct. Okay? So, that is the first principle you have to have interconnected an empty network. Next is the principle of complete streets. So, whenever you are designing a street, you have to keep in mind that the street should be designed for all modes of transport, including non-motorized transport. So, even when you are designing a main street, for example, this is an example of a main street, right? this is a cross section of a main street, which is has a 36 meter right of way. So, even when you are designing a main street like this, you have to keep in mind that on both ends of the street, there should be there should be provision given to bicycles, there should be provision given to footpath, should have some parking, should have uh, green infrastructure. So, all this should be included along with your carriageway on both sides and most uh, probably a uh, uh, rapid transit of some sort in the medium in the median of the road right so whenever even when you are designing a prior, the uh, arterial in your uh, urban area you should keep in mind that you should design it for all modes that is what is called complete streets designed and operated to enable safe access of all users you can no longer provide or develop urban streets, urban arterials or even local streets without keeping in mind the NMT people or the NMT users. You have to keep them in mind. This promotes equitable allocation of right of way and there is a balance of be, uh, between the movement of pedestrians, cyclists, transit and motorized vehicles. So, you should provide that balance. If you do not provide the infrastructure, do not provide interconnected infrastructure for NMT, the likelihood of people traveling by NMT modes will reduce and then again we will have the same issues that we have with vehicular transport of emissions and congestion and so on and so forth. So, remember the second guiding principle is complete streets. The third one is looking at how streets can be bicycle friendly. Now, it is very important to understand to that to promote NMT uh, and different forms of non-motorized transport in your urban area, you have to design the facilities in such a way that they are friendly to those users. If you do not have bicycle tracks on each side of the roads, then you should ensure that the pavement, the carriageway itself is designed in such a manner that it makes the bicycle users feel safe and if they feel safe, then they would ride it a whole lot. So, provide bike lanes, bike routes and secure bike parking to make bicycle an easy option. The other thing in our urban areas is parking, parking is a big issue. right? We do not have good parking facilities wherever we want to park either our motorized vehicle, two wheeler or even bicycle, we do not have good parking spaces. So, we have to provide good parking spaces along with bicycle lanes and routes that encourage people to bicycle. You would also see that now in order to encourage bicycle, there are many uh, corporate offices that provide uh, locker and shower facilities. So, if you if they have employees that are uh, bicycling, bicycling to office uh, from a long way away, then they provide them uh, good locker facilities and shower facilities. So, that if they sweat along their way, they can come and take a shower in the office and change into uh, proper office. Uh, uh, clothing. So, that also is bicycle friendliness. So, that encourages people to bicycle to work. right? So, that will encourage active lifestyle, health benefits and a sustainable alternative to motorized transport. Bicycling has several health benefits as you may imagine it increases the physical activity levels of physical activity and helps in reducing 
a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, diseases related uh, be it uh, uh, cholesterol increase high cholesterol or blood pressure or so on and so forth right and that lastly it also provides the vital first mile and last mile connectivity to public transit systems so when you are trying to encourage people to use public transit systems bicycle uh, bicycle access to public transport stations is also very very important because now if you have good bicycle parking say for example at a metro stop then people will just use your use their bicycle come there park it and then use your uh, use the metro uh, some of the metro systems around the world also allow uh, certain types of bicycles to be taken along with them uh, on the metro during certain hours of the day so that even that is uh, that is a uh, that is called multimodal transport now you can allow different modes to coexist with each other so that now uh, if it's uh, the non peak hour the traveler can just take their bicycle on to the metro uh, metro rail uh, go to their destination again take it out and bicycle on it so you can have that sort of facility as well but at least bare minimum have good connectivity from uh, the catchment area of a metro station or a bus station or a brt station to the uh, to access the metro rails or brts and then have at least good parking there so that they can uh, come and avail of the mass rapid transit or the public transportation in your city so bicycle friendliness is the third principle that has to be kept in mind when you are designing for an empty infrastructure the fourth principle is walkability right walkability is defined more by the quality of the place than by any transport related metric so although we call pedestrian transport we also, although use it as uh, use the frame uh, use the phrase pedestrian transport but when we are talking about people walking or the walkability uh, of a space we are looking at more than just the transportation aspect we are looking at the environment that is around the public uh, around the pedestrians a good environment a good safe environment encourages people to walk and hence uh, increases uh, the um, nmt uh, usage of uh, of uh, non motorized usage right so attractive pedestrian environment with high levels of uh, high level of priority safety and amenities you have to have the environment conducive to pedestrians you have to have a uh, lot of uh, shade cover lot of trees uh, for night you have to have lot of uh, lighting uh, the space given for people to walk has to be comfortable so that they are not uh, rubbing their shoulders against each other so that all of these uh, things put together is known as the walking environment so you have to make sure that the environment given to the pedestrians is such that it encourages people to walk so this is a, a rendering of a of a town center in bhubaneswar as uh, bhubaneswar is one of the smart cities <coughs> sorry as bhubaneswar is one of the smart cities so they are planning to have their town center remodeled or redesigned in such a way that it encourages a lot of pedestrian activity another aspect uh, of improving walkability is to have compact development patterns with a good mix of land uses and active frontage so what what we mean by active frontage is that if you make the buildings uh, the frontage the front entrance of the building adjacent to the pedestrians then they are encouraged that the safety levels also goes up uh, instead instead of that if you have for example vehicular parking in front of a building and then you have so you have vehicular parking here and then you have pedestrians so then people are unable to see when they are walking they are unable to see what is in the uh, building there so what people like especially in commercial areas is to kind of feel that there is somebody right next to them while you are walking so if these buildings the uh, the frontage of the buildings are uh, are in such a manner that they make the pedestrians walking along alongside them feel safe then that is something that uh, encourages more pedestrian activity so you always try to avoid parking in front of the building so you can have parking behind the building uh, we are not discouraging parking altogether but have parking behind the building and have your uh, pedestrian uh, um, footpath or your pedestrian sidewalk 
right up to the frontage of the building. <coughs> Compact development allows different types of land uses to be close to each other. If the distances are close to each other, then uh, people are more and more encouraged to walk. Uh, similarly, if there are good mixes of land uses, people can go from one place to the other in uh, short walking distances. So, in order to encourage walkability, you have to have the environment which, which is conducive to walking. So, you have to provide the environment and we have looked at what are all the elements involved in providing the environment. The next thing is or the next design principle is comfort. Whenever it comes to uh, NMT uh, facilities or design of NMT facilities, comfort is one of the most important things that uh, users always want. Right? So, whenever you ask somebody uh, why do not you, why are not you walking to your uh, bank which is only 200 meters away, they would say it is too hot to walk or uh, it is raining so we cannot walk or the footpath is broken so we cannot walk. So, it is always the level of comfort all these are uh, pointing towards the level of comfort of the users. So, if you want to encourage more uh, pedestrian activity or more NMT activity, you have to somehow quantify this uh, level of comfort right comfort is, uh, is is a feeling it is very qualitative you cannot uh, uh, my comfort level may be different from your comfort level so there but there has to be if you try to uh, quantify it in a certain manner you can do so and then level and and then uh, set a threshold for that uh, that uh, measure of comfort and make sure that you provide that so it provides shade, weather protection, pedestrian amenities, visual interest. All of this improves the desirability of walking and also uh, pedestrian act and also cycling activity, bicycling activity, right? So, if you are providing uh, some benches alongside, uh, uh, say, a commercial uh, commercial area where uh, people can just walk alongside um, window shop or do whatever they want to do, or maybe there is a cafeteria where they want to sit and have a cup of coffee. So, all of this encourages or provides comfort uh, to the pedestrian and then he or she would like to uh, like to uh, walk or use bicycle. Uh, it shortens the perception of distance. So, if you make something very comfortable, people will not think that uh, it is too arduous to walk or it is too far away. Uh, suddenly, you, they have too many things to do along the way, too many things to see along the way and uh, the perception of distance then shortens, right? Then it feels like, oh, it is just a small distance away or it is just a 5 minute walk away. Uh, so, uh, give, providing them comfort uh, always is uh, shortening their perception of distance. Thirdly, it creates a high quality public realm with essential amenities such as toilets, dustbins and street benches. All of this put together not only uh, provides the environment for walking and bicycling, but it also enhances comfort levels. So, just as we have to ensure the comfort level of a motorist while he or she is driving his uh, personal vehicle or a two wheeler, in the same manner we have to cater to the comfort levels of the pedestrians or the bicyclists when he or she is uh, using their bicycle or walking along the um, along a sidewalk or a footpath. It is no point uh, having uh, asking everybody to walk uh, and encouraging everybody to walk, but not providing with uh, providing them with comfortable infrastructure or comfortable facilities. You have to take that into account, right? For example, when you are uh, driving your two wheeler, uh, nobody likes too many potholes, right? It is very uncomfortable, or nobody likes too many uh, speed humps. That is also very uncomfortable, right? But so, similarly, when you are taking care of the comfort of the people riding your uh, vehicle, uh, riding your vehicles, you also have to take into account uh, the comfort levels of the NMT users. Moving ahead, the sixth principle which is a very essential principle is universal accessibility. When we are designing for NMT infrastructure, we have to keep in mind that we are trying to design for all types of users who come under the ambit of non-motorized transport users, 
right that include people with um, uh, disabilities especially able people uh, small children elderly people so all of them combined uh, are uh, categorized as non motorized transport users so uh, here is an example of a wheelchair accessible road uh, road crossing in singapore right so for if somebody is trying to cross from here to here so these are there are no there are ramps made in such a manner that he or she may be able to use the wheelchair to cross even this this sort of tata, uh, tacitile um, uh, flooring is uh, ensures that uh, for example a blind person understands where he or she is walking so universal accessibility simplifies navigation and reduces physical effort when we are talking about nmt users we have to always realize that there is a level of effort that goes into walking or bicycling physical effort so we have to always try to minimize that physical effort physically handicapped person should be able to navigate without pedestrian uh, uh, navigate the pedestrian facilities without external assistance so that should be our goal our goal should not be that uh, uh, a specially able person will always have somebody uh, helping him or her uh, he or she should be able to uh, navigate through these facilities by themselves so that should be our aim while you are designing these nmt facilities that is why you would see a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, design currently are barrier free designs right these are barrier free meaning that it has no barriers to all it, it provides no barriers to uh, any type of nmt users any user can use this so you would see even when you are uh, coming across uh, the entrance of a building uh, in the past you used to have maybe only steps to the entrance but now also you have to have a uh, ramp access to the building so that is an example of a barrier free building so similarly when you are on a sidewalk you have to have ramps at the intersections so that people can easily go up and down the uh, sidewalk at the intersections and not have to uh, jump on on top of it or off of it right usually uh, people can easily go down the ramps or slopes so universal accessibility is something that is very very essential in case of non motorized transport infrastructure design <coughs> the next one and uh, crucial one is safety you have to have your uh, facilities designed in such a way that they the users feel safe while using such a facility so uh, say for example you have uh, such a large intersection right so this is an uh, example of uh, again a conceptual view of uh, the bhuvaneshwar master plan so if you have a very large intersection where you expect people to uh, cross from here to there and from there to there and from there to there so you have to have proper safe infrastructure that would allow them to do so right you have to have a median uh, a median refuge island because there are i think uh, two lanes here and another two lanes here so you cannot expect a person uh, a bicyclist or a pedestrian to uh, to cross at one go so you have to have a, a refuge island you have to extend provide curb extensions so that this distance that they are crossing reduces right you have to extend your curb so that the right of way uh, carriage way reduces at the intersection and this distance is shorter for the pedestrian or the bicyclist to cross so all of this includes uh, what uh, includes the aspects of safety when you are providing for uh, signals at the intersection you have to make sure that there is a uh, nmt phase right uh, in many such large inter intersections you would see uh is in some of the modern intersections you would see that there is a all red phase the all red phase allows people to criss cross and uh, cross in any direction that they want to cross in so if somebody is crossing from 1 and wants to go to 4 uh, he or she need not take this route he can he or she can now take the direct route here so what the signal the signals are designed in such a way that it provides an all red phase so it is red for 
this approach, this approach, this approach, uh, this approach and this approach. So, that the pedestrians can cross in a criss cross manner as well uh, and all the vehicles at all the legs of the intersection are, uh, uh, are uh, seeing red and are stopped. So, you will see such kind of uh, pedestrian signalization also especially in case of large intersections where there is a lot of uh, pedestrian movement happening. So, all of this comes under the realm of safety. So, uh, all these aspects should be taken into account when you are trying to design for a um, for a uh, any kind of NMT infrastructure. Uh, physical or uh, um, visible buffer between motorized and non-motorized vehicles, right? Uh, any kind of buffer, uh, it, may, uh, it may be a tree buffer or it may be on street parking that provides a buffer. Such buffers also help uh, the movement of non-motorized uh, users. Okay? Moving ahead closely with uh, safety, the other aspect is security. Uh, security of vulnerable groups such as women and children in the public realm uh, should be ensured. Uh, nowadays, you would see that there is a large presence of uh, public CCTV cameras uh, along streets. Uh, also, uh, the provision of uh, proper uh, lighting uh, during evenings and nights is very essential in order to uh, help people feel secure while they are walking, especially uh, women and elderly people and children. So, uh, security has to be um, uh, has to be paramount while you are designing for them. Uh, there is also crime prevention through environmental design. Uh, which discourages criminal behavior through urban design principles. So, you can do so by having small lights alongside the walls as well uh, alongside the your uh, uh, facade of your building as well. So, there are design principles, urban design principles that integrates security into them and natural surveillance obviously that we talked about. So, all of these principles uh, ensure that people feel secure while they are using non motorized transport as well right large windows at upper levels promote casual supervision of the street anybody sitting on the uh, the second floor can just have a look uh, on the street that gives a sense of security right clearly defined public and private space uh, clear building signage so all of this gives them a sense of security so while you are designing again safety is one thing security is another thing both of them have to be taken into consideration while developing NMT infrastructure. <coughs> uh, the ninth one is wayfinding. So, often uh, we have street signs uh, which again are geared towards uh, motorized uh, users. right? Uh, so, uh, for a non-motorized pedestrian, uh, it is uh, no uh, use uh, for him or her to see a sign that says, uh, the destination is 10 kilometers away because that does not make him or her uh, is not useful for him or her because uh, they are not going to walk for 10 kilometers. So, when when people are walking for shorter distances, you have to have uh, maybe uh, wayfinding uh, at a very local level, right? Maybe the uh, at, at the street level, uh, for example, you have to have such boards. Uh, at the street level telling them if you go this side the post office will be this side for example if you go this side uh, the school will be on on this side which is a 5 minute walk away so in terms of time if you give uh, wayfinding in terms of time that helps uh, a pedestrian or a bicyclist um, rather than giving it in the form of a distance right time always uh, the perception of distance uh, reduces if you give it uh, a, a time metric so uh, wayfinding uh, wayfinding has to be easy and legible right uh, it, there, there should be in multiple languages maybe uh, people uh, uh, and and wayfinding should be in the form that people uh, who are walking both are local as well as are maybe from out of that region both for both of them it should be easy to understand right uh, I may know where the local temple is because I stay there but somebody, who is coming from out of town or from another uh, neighborhood may not know where the local temple is. So, just to say that the temple is that way may not help him or her. So, you have to give them a better, naviga uh, better navigation so that they can walk. Uh, this definitely uh, promotes 
tourism. So, whenever you go to uh, a tourist spot, you may have a uh, many of them have a walking tour, right? So, you should uh, keep an eye and see how during the walking tour there are good legible and empty wayfinding or walking wayfinding. They tell you exactly how to go get from point A to point B, which encourages people to walk. That is very essential as well. Lastly, protection from encroachment, right? This is one of the uh, biggest things that uh, uh, we as Indians face uh, uh, alongside our uh, uh, footpaths, uh, especially in, uh, uh, in the busy commercial areas as well as sometimes in our uh, residential areas. Uh, people either uh, park their four wheelers or two wheelers on the, uh, on the footpath or there are vendors who are encroaching upon the footpath. So, you ha hardly have any space to walk on that footpath. So, rather than, uh, so, uh, rather than uh, 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 fighting with the vendors for example, to move away from there, if we provide them a proper space for vending and incorporate that into your design, that will help you, uh, that will help in the uh, walkability or uh, that will help in the, um, uh, help promote uh, NMT usage. Uh, for, uh, also parking, if you just have proper parking areas for vehicles to park, uh, they would not, I am sure would not park along uh, on the footpath and uh, encroach upon the footpath. So, all of these have to be uh, taken into account. Of course, there has to be uh, effective enforcement. Uh, so, all of these regulations and rules should be known to everybody where the parking spots are, where the vendor areas are, so that they are uh, they are only utilizing such spaces. So, those were all the 10 guiding principles that uh, should be used while you are designing uh, a an empty facility. Now, supportive of those guiding principles, there are 6 things that one has to keep in mind. These are supportive principles, right. The first thing you have to keep in mind the informal sector. You have to make sure that you have mixed usage, mixed land use alongside uh, to promote NMT infrastructure. Make sure transit is given priority in, in those areas where you are providing NMT infrastructure. Effective parking management has to be there. This will, uh, this will ensure that uh, there is support to the bicycle industry and also will give rise to the culture of bicycling. Right? These are supportive principles in addition to the 10 guiding principles that you should keep in mind while you are developing an empty infrastructure. If we quickly look at them, informal sector, right? Informal sector will always be present on, alongside the footpaths, but if you ensure that they be present uh, within a certain distance and still leaving a clear path for the pedestrians to walk, that, that will uh, incorporate both uh, the vendors as well as the pedestrians. Rather than making them uh, encroach upon the entire footpath, you should give them a designated space. Mixed use, a diverse mix of, uh, diverse mix and complementary land uses in compact pattern allows residents and workers to walk to work or shop rather than driving for all of their needs, right. If you have a park, if, if, you, have a, if you have a park here, you have your uh, residences here, you have your offices here, you have an open plaza with lots of restaurants here, you have a, a sporting a tennis court here. So, all of the, this is a complete mixed use area. So, if you have such areas, people will obviously, uh, whoever lives here will just walk to the restaurant here or walk to the tennis court here or just walk to work from home. So, all of this will be within the walking distance as this, this encourages uh, an empty uh, usage. Transit priority, we have, uh, we have already looked at it. NMT provides the very crucial first mile and last mile connectivity. So, whenever you are prioritizing transit, uh, you have to make sure that you provide for NMT infrastructure or vice versa. When you provide, uh, there, when, when you see that there is a lot of NMT usage around uh, uh, in a certain area, you might as well give priority to transit usage because these people who are using an empty, they would end up using public transport for the longer haul, right. Uh, parking management, we have also briefly looked at that. 
uh, if you provide on street parking that provides natural buffer to the pedestrians from the traffic so that is always uh, encouraged but the main point is you have to have proper designated spots for parking and there has to be enforcement when people are not parking at the right spots so you have to take that into consideration as well uh, it has been noticed that bicycle industry uh, gets benefited a whole lot when you design for good bicycle facilities good nmt facilities on the roads a bicycle industry uh, can be supported uh, just by encouraging and providing these uh, facilities and finally building a uh, cycling culture we already have lot of people who use bicycle uh, for their daily needs but we most of them are captive users right most of them are users who cannot afford other means of transportation so that should not be the case uh, they should be choice users they should be choosing bicycle uh, out of their own will uh, and that will only happen when you have good uh, an empty infrastructure in place so building a bicycle culture will bring about uh, a supportive uh, will support the bicycle industry which will then help the uh, nmt users grow in your urban areas so that brings us to the end of this lecture uh, again this is the reference that we have used and it is free for download at this uh, website what we have uh, uh, informed you today are about the 10 guiding principles in nmt design and along with the 10 guiding principles we have also told you about the six supporting principles all the guiding and the supporting principles are listed here in a nutshell you have to provide the environment you have to design the environment in such a manner so that it encourages the nmt users to come out and use the nmt modes rather than using their motorized vehicles for all different types of purposes thank you for your attention